Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I have one very brief thing uh, off the top, and then I'm happy to dive into your questions. So uh, first, as we noted yesterday, we strongly condemn yesterday's terrorist attack against Israelis near Eli in the West Bank that killed four individuals. We express our deepest condolences to the families of those killed. There is no justification for terrorism. We are also deeply concerned by the rising levels of violence in the West Bank in recent months. There are troubling reports of extremist settler violence against Palestinian civilians, including the death of a Palestinian um, child and other injuries. We likewise condemn these violent acts and also extend our condolences to the families of those affected. Accountability and justice should be pursued with equal rigor in all cases of extremist violence, and we welcome the IDF's condemnation of these acts and expect the Israeli government to ensure full accountability and legal uh, prosecution for those responsible for these attacks, in addition to compensation for lost homes and property. Uh, and with that, um, I'm happy to uh, take some questions. Uh, go ahead, Said. Thank you. I mean, uh, we're a huge target right there. But you know, that attack came right after an attack on the Janine camp, where the Israelis used Apache helicopter against civilians. Six yeah. people were killed, including a 14-year-old girl you know, that should be dreaming about boys and schools and things like that. So no condemnation there for an unprovoked attack that the Israelis conducted and were there for nine hours, for nine hours using Apache helicopters, using all kinds of weapons supplied by the United States of America. Said, we continue to work directly with uh, our Israeli partners with the Palestinian Authority to promote steps to advance uh, de-escalation. Uh, as you've heard us say, Assistant Secretary Leaf is in the region now, uh, continuing to be directly engaged with the parties on efforts to restore calm. This is, of course, something the Secretary uh, and others uh, across the department are uh, deeply engaged with as well. Uh, and we remain steadfast in our work to promote de-escalation and even beyond this, in environment, which you've heard me say before, and where Israelis and Palestinians are afforded equal measures of security, peace, and prosperity. Uh, you know, in the words of a former U.S. diplomat who was really involved in all this process, it's events in Geneva and Eile should surprise no one a perfect storm of Israeli, a 56-year-old Israeli expression. I mean, this is, this is it. You keep saying uh, that Putin could end the Ukraine war by deciding to end the war. Israel could end the occupation by deciding to end the occupation. You empower that occupation by supplying Israel with endless amount of weapons and aid and cover at the UN politically everywhere, correct? Said, I, I, I take issue with, with, with that characterization. Uh, we have been very clear about uh, noting uh, violence uh, extreme violence, uh, noting terrorism, uh, condemning it uh, when it happens. Uh, you've heard us uh, be very, very clear uh, about this. And specifically, uh, again, we have been very, very um, clear about our condemnation of the terrorist attack uh, in Ellie. Uh, but we also have condemned the ongoing uh, continuation of violence in Israel and the West Bank in recent weeks that, yes, has killed and injured uh, Palestinians and Israels and, uh, and Israelis. Uh, and this is something that we're going to continue to work directly with the Palestinian Authority on uh, to promote steps towards de-escalation, as well as uh, work closely with uh, our Israeli partners also. Let me raise this issue because I promised to raise it. Three years ago, three years ago, come when, come Friday, a young relative of mine, Ahmed Erika, was shot dead by the Israelis for no reason, but that's not the point. They have kept his body since then, as they keep many corpses, Palestinian corpses. And his father called me yesterday, and I promised to raise this issue. Where the U.S. Where does the U.S. stand? Where does the U.S. stand on things like this, practices like this, where they keep the bodies for a year, for two, for three, never uh, allowing the family closure, never allowing for a decent burial. First, um, Said, let me say, just I'm very sorry for your for your family's loss. But first, 
Uh, also, we have uh, spoken to this numerous times. Uh, families must be able to bury their loved ones uh, in a dignified and unimpeded manner. That continues to be uh, our view on this. Uh, still, on, can I can I go to side? Then I'll come to you. Yeah, go ahead, side. I want to ask you about this uh, today's uh, attack on a Palestinian village, Tumas Haya. You know, most of the property, in fact, probably ninety percent of the homes, uh, are owned by U.S. citizens. These this property is owned by American citizens that. You know, live in America part of the time, live in the West Bank part of the time, and so on. They go to school and, and they have businesses and so on. I mean, is the U.S. really taking any tangible measures to ensure that this does not happen again? I mean, you know, according to all Israeli reports, the settlers were attacking the village while the soldiers were watching. Said, we uh, continue to engage on this issue directly. Uh, we take steps. Uh, through dialogue, through uh, our engagement in the region, uh, through raising this directly with Israeli officials, as well as officials in the Palestinian Authority. We've been very clear that any kind of activity or actions that uh, will incite t tensions will take us away from our ultimate goal of a negotiated two-state solution. Uh, we find those to be unproductive, and you've heard us say so. Um, go ahead. Uh, following up on that, you know, today, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu said he was planning to go ahead with a thousand new homes in Ali. I know you guys have recently condemned the, the, <coughs> the settlement expansion. What's your reaction to that? He also said that you know his response to terrorism is to build up our country. Of course, settlements are theoretically not in Israel, but in what will be uh, a Palestinian state. Well, we've been uh, very clear about this, that unilateral actions such as this one, such as settlement advancement, uh, will only incite tensions and undermine the prospect uh, of a two-state solution. Uh, sign. Sure. Um, I guess I'm wondering to t if you could speak more broadly to um, you know, your ongoing relationship with the, the, the Netanyahu government. Um, you know, are you, in, in re response to uh, the concerns that you're raising about the deteriorating situation, are you kind of um, stepping up your diplomacy with, with officials in the government or, or communicating um, as well as what you're saying in statements and from the podium? You know, what are you saying to, to Israeli officials um, about, about the, these concerns? Well, I'm certainly not going to uh, get into the specifics of, of, of private diplomatic engagements, but of course um, uh, we continue to uh, robustly engage with our, our partners in Israel. As I said, uh, Assistant Secretary Leaf is in the region uh, engaging uh, with the parties on efforts to restore calm, to offer some um, specifics uh, on her travel. Uh, in Jerusalem, the Assistant Secretary will meet with senior Israeli political and military leadership to discuss areas of mutual interest, including including expanding and deepening uh, Israel's integration into the Middle East and constraining Iran's uh, destabilizing behavior. Uh, in Ramallah, Assistant Secretary Leaf will meet with senior Palestinian leadership to discuss priority issues, including U.S. efforts to support the Palestinian people. Uh, but broadly, Simon, uh, we raise uh, and engage these issues directly um, with um, Israeli leadership, with our partners in uh, the Israeli government, uh, through individuals here at the State Department headquarters, but also at our um, uh, embassy uh, in the country as well. Are you concerned so. that the actions of the is Israeli government are jeopardizing the, um, you know, the normalizations that happened under the Abraham Accords and future normalization that uh, the secretary was was discussing while in Saudi Arabia recently. You know, sp specifically noting that there's reporting that um, Morocco is no longer going to be hosting a, a, a ministerial of the Negev forum, um, which was which uh, has sort of already been delayed several times and, and it seems to be being delayed again. You know, the, is the the Israeli government doing enough to? Um, to sort of address the concerns of, of these regional countries that are obviously um, don't 
want to be seen to be engaging with as well at this time? Well, uh, uh, regional uh, integration is not just an important priority for the United States. It's also an important priority for uh, Israel itself, including uh, the, the, the Netanyahu government. I don't take my word for it. This is something that they um, uh, clearly have spoken about as well, and I you know, let them speak to, to their own priorities. Uh, but broadly, we continue to believe that there are tangible benefits, of course, to regional integration, uh, and there's important issues uh, in the security space, trade space, and otherwise uh, that can continue to be collaborated on through those uh, mechanisms. Uh, as it relates to the Negev ministerial, we're continuing to consult with partners uh, about a, a neg second Negev ministerial this year, but I don't have uh, any specific updates to, to offer on that. Uh, anything else on this region before we move away? Uh, okay, I'm gonna, let me do, uh, Ron, I'll, I'll come back to you, Jenny. Go ahead in the back yesterday on U.S.-Iran indirect talks citing an EU official that European partners are not entirely sure of the contours of the current discussion. So my question is that uh, why is this? Because Mr. President and Mr. Secretary always have emphasized on how this administration is close to U.S. allies and they want to revive ties which they believe uh, were hurt during the previous administration. But now, why your close allies are not aware of what is exactly going on between you and Islamic Republic? Of so Iran? we are in constant touch with our partners and allies, including those in the E3 uh, on uh, issues related to Iran. Uh, I'm certainly not going to detail those conversations or give you specifics from here, but we uh, absolutely are uh, in touch with our, our partners and allies on this. Okay, I have one more. Uh -huh. Um, House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Mr. McCall wrote an open letter to Joe Biden about re-engaging with Iran again. In the letter he says that the House Foreign Affairs Committee has had a request pending with the State Department since April 11 and special that a special envoy for Iran Mr. Mali testified before the committee, which the State Department has not fulfilled. Why? So we remain deeply committed to continued close engagement with Congress uh, in a bipartisan manner, and department officials engage with Congress on a regular basis on U.S.-Iran policy. Uh, I will also note that uh, it was only a number of weeks ago that Deputy Secretary Sherman was on the Hill uh, talking about this uh, very exact topic. Uh, so we engage with uh, Congress regularly. Uh, I'm not going to get into specifics and don't have um, any um, uh, visits to Congress to specifically preview, but this is, of course, something we're going to continue to remain deeply engaged on. Anything else on Iran specifically before we move away? Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll get to everybody. Don't worry. The top Iranian negotiator, uh, Ali Bakri, today he met with the EU officials and they, he said that so glad to discuss the lifting sanctions. Do you have any plan to lift any sanctions on Iran and then do you have any plan to release the, the money that Iraq owes to Iran? You're, you're speaking about the, the meeting in, in, in the lifting sanctions, softening but, sanctions. But are you, are you speaking about the, the meeting in Doha? Yeah, so look, we are in constant touch with our allies and partners, including the E3 uh, and the European in Union on issues relating to Iran. Uh, I'm just not going to uh, get into the specifics of those conversations and uh, would refer you to the EU to speak about anything about uh, their engagements today. And today, the, the, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, they advanced a bipartisan bill to make the Iranian sanctions permanent. To what extent do you agree with this idea? And you want the Iranian I, I'm certainly right? not gonna. I'm not gonna comment on um, on on active uh, legislation that's uh, going through whatever process it's going through in the House. What I will say is that as it relates to the malign and destabilizing activities of the Iranian regime, we continue to have a number of tools at our disposal. Um, sanctions have uh, continued to be a, a, a big piece of that and have uh, been uh, instrumental in continuing to hold the uh, Iranian uh, regime uh, accountable. What, what's your comment on the, the current situation in North East Syria? You know that the Turkey has increased their drone strikes, and the, the, the yesterday they, they strike a car in Kamshlo and they killed civilian people. Then what's your comment on that? Have you engaged with Turkey to stop 
these attacks on your local partner? L let me say a couple things. First, uh, Turkey, of course, is an important uh, NATO ally, and we continue to consult with them uh, on a number of issues broadly uh, as it relates to that region. One of the key uh, areas of priorities for the United States continues to be ensuring that uh, the efforts and work that's been done to degrade the uh, influence of ISIS uh, is not uh, impeded on. And so uh, we continue to be very clear that any activity taking place that puts civilians at risk, that uh, puts the, at risk uh, our efforts to degrade ISIS uh, or puts uh, American personnel at risk, uh, we certainly uh, uh, we would take issue with. All right, I'm going to what's your name? Jenny, you've had your hand up yeah, patiently. Go ahead. Following the president's comments last night, like Ming Xi Jinping to a dictator and saying he had no idea about the balloon traversing the United States. Does this building agree with that assessment that he did not know about the balloon? And have there been any conversations between U.S. and Chinese officials in the wake of those comments to explain them? And are you concerned that this is going to set back the progress the secretary said he made on his trip to Beijing? So uh, I will let the Department of Defense and Department of Justice and ODNI speak to uh, any uh, information that they have as it relates to the surveillance uh, balloon program and any intelligence assessments there. I'm certainly not going to speak to that from here. Uh, and also, I don't have any uh, specifics about any uh, diplomatic uh, engagements uh, to read out. What I will say is that um, it should come as no surprise, of course, that we have uh, differences and disagreements with the PRC. And the president believes that diplomacy, including uh, this recent trip undertaken by the secretary, is a responsible way to manage tensions, uh, clear up misperceptions, avoid miscalculations. Uh, and all of this is, uh, is in our interest uh, to do that. Uh, that does not mean, of course, we will not be blunt and, and forthright about about, uh, about our differences. Uh, you uh, all, I know, uh, tuned in to the Secretary's um, uh, press conference uh, in Beijing at the conclusion of his trip where he talked about a number of uh, important issues and the uh, uh, progress that was made uh, in a number of areas in conversations with senior uh, PRC officials. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing to uh, engage on a, a number of issues as it relates to uh, the, the complex uh, relationship that we have with the PRC. Have any U.S. officials been demarched by Beijing? Uh, I, don't, I don't have any uh, specific diplomatic engagements to offer. Uh, let me go to Olivia, then I will. Go ahead. Just to follow up on, on Jenny's question, mm -hmm. because some lawmakers have called for more transparency into what we learned from and about the surveillance balloon. I know you just deferred to other agencies, but do you think that that would be constructive or detrimental to the relationship with China to reveal uh, some more? I, I'm just not going to uh, parse uh, uh, or, or uh, offer uh, insights on a, on a hypothetical and, and the, the provision of additional information on this program would certainly uh, come from elsewhere, and so I would I would refer to those agencies on that. Um, go ahead, Alex. Uh, just to clarify, uh -huh. uh, the comments that, you know, uh, during the, given what happened during the past 24 hours, the progress that Secretary had, appears to have made, um, do you think that uh, has faded or wasted? Uh, Absolutely, not at all. Uh, uh, we believe that engagement and dialogue and diplomacy uh, are integral to a number of the issues uh, that we think uh, are uh, important uh, as it relates to our bilateral relationship uh, with the PRC. Uh, and there are a number of areas uh, addressing the climate crisis, uh, getting home uh, wrongfully detained uh, American citizens, uh, securing cooperation uh, as it relates to the provision of fentanyl and fentanyl precursors, uh, and defending uh, the economic interests of U.S. workers and companies. Uh, those things um, happen uh, through dialogue and engagement. And it's also, as I noted in speaking to Jenny's question, it's something that the president also um, uh, knows and, and believes uh, is critically important to uh, ensure that there are no miscalculations made and no uh, misperceptions um, happening. Uh, that he made in Beijing on Russia and China. Some of us have covered that because, you know, uh, based on your statements in this room. Uh, but we all not, also know that the Secretary has gone from um, suggesting that Chinese government might decide uh, to provide weapons to Russia to calling Chinese officials in Beijing to be vigilant to ensure that Chinese companies are not doing so. I'm just wondering, uh, I understand diplomacy is how you guys are making a living in this building, but if uh, this rhetorical shift suggests that uh, concerns that China might, Chinese government, 
make it impossible for this war is evading. I think the secretary's uh, comments speak for themselves, and I think we continue to be very uh, clear-eyed and concerned about broadly uh, any kind of uh, support uh, for Russia from from any country or entity that could take the shape of uh, the provision of lethal aid that could be used for uh, further uh, harm uh, in Ukraine, and that's something that we're going to continue to be uh, vigilant about and 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 pay attention to. But you don't really don't believe that Chinese defense companies can. Uh, go ahead and send weapons to Russia without the information or green light of Chinese government to you? Uh, Alex, I'm certainly not going to uh, get into parse or get into the specifics of, of, of the Chinese system and, and, ha and how that works. The Secretary's comments uh, were very clear in his press conference, and I think they speak for itself. Shannon, go, uh, go ahead. I'll come back to you. In you know, President Biden's comments, Secretary Blinken said in an interview when he left China that the chapter on the spy balloon was closed. Do Biden's comments run counter to that assessment? Uh, not at all. Uh, as I said, uh, just answering Jenny's question, that the president believes diplomacy, including uh, the visit that was undertaken by the secretary, are a responsible way to manage tensions, uh, clear up misinterpretations, uh, and avoid miscalculations. The, again, the important thing to remember, and the secretary uh, spoke about this uh, a little bit uh, in his press conference, is that um, this uh, it is important, and you've heard him say this before, about um, de-risking uh, and not uh, decoupling as it relates to uh, our relationship uh, with the PRC. And again, there are a number of issues uh, at the nexus of our bilateral relationship with the PRC, whether it be addressing the climate crisis, whether it be uh, the, the provision of fentanyl and fentanyl precursors, uh, that we believe that we have an opportunity to cooperate uh, with the P PRC on to address these very important transnational issues. Uh, Additionally, I will note is that throughout all of um, uh, throughout a number of the bilateral engagements that the secretary has had in his time as secretary, a consistent theme continues to be that as it relates to the PRC, the international community expects um, uh, inspe expects the United States and the PRC to manage this relationship responsibly, and that's something that uh, the secretary, the president, and this administration uh, intends to do so. Uh, Jan Okay, go ahead. On Secretary Blinken's comment, yeah. you know, he said the chapter was closed if China doesn't do it again. Can you specify what he meant? Does he mean fly a surveillance balloon over mainland USA or cut down the program altogether? Uh, I'm, I, I'm certainly not going to uh, parse uh, the, the Secretary's comment specifically, but yes, uh, of course, doing uh, uh, infringing on our territorial integrity and our airspace, uh, again, would certainly uh, be a step in the wrong direction uh, as it relates to this, and we were quite clear about that uh, back in uh, January, February uh, as well, uh, February, when um, this, this first transpired. Uh, Janny, go ahead. In a Chinese foreign ministry a spokesperson said that China called the United States a political provocation. So how do you respond to this? The president and the secretary have been very clear is that we will continue to responsibly manage this relationship, maintain open lines of communication with the PRC. Uh, but that, of course, does not mean we will not be blunt and forthright about our differences. The president, the secretary, we have been uh, very clear about the areas in which we disagree, including um, uh, the clear differences we see when it comes to democracies and autocracies. Uh, and so we have been very clear that we will not hesitate to stand up uh, for issues and stand up for our values uh, uh, when it's uh, in our interest. Do you think uh, the United States and China relationship will be relaxed if enough? for China to help in North Korea's nuclear and missile provocation? Well, this is something that the Secretary uh, raised directly uh, on his travels. He made clear that PRC officials, uh, that that they the, and, and the PRC writ large has the capability and responsibility to use its influence with the DPRK to encourage Pyongyang to return to the negotiating table and to cease its uh, provocative acts. Well, Abby, you've had your hand up. Cyber security issues. Okay, yeah. then I'll come to you. Sorry. US and uh, South Korea cyber security talks. Do you have any detail on this? Because they started yesterday. Uh, 
Uh, I don't have any uh, specific updates, but I'm happy to, to check with the team and get back to you. All right, go ahead, Abby. Fairly scathing uh, statement following the secretary's trip, saying that it uh, had yielded nothing substantial except me a mere promise of meetings in the future. Um, I wondered if you had any response to that, and uh, more specifically to his criticism that there has been no lack of, or there's been a lack of progress on the Americans who were detained in China. Uh, thanks for your question, Abby. Uh, I have seen Chairman McCall's statement on the secretary's successful and productive. Uh, trip to the PRC. Uh, broadly speaking, we strongly disagree with uh, the majority of the chairman's conclusions and would point out that, candidly, there are several inaccuracies. Uh, it almost feels as if the chairman and I observed two different uh, trips from back here. Uh, first, it said that the chairman, uh, he said that it appears that the State Department is stopping export controls and sanctions. This is absolutely false. One of the reoccurring points uh, in the Secretary's engagements with PRC officials was PRC officials expressing their concerns uh, on export controls and sanctions, with the Secretary repeatedly telling uh, PRC officials that we would continue to do what is needed to advance U.S. interests. This is also something that the Secretary spoke about publicly uh, as well uh, in his press conference and other uh, engagements when in Beijing. Uh, the Chairman, as you so noted, also mentioned a lack of progress on several issues, including wrongful detained individuals, fentanyl, and Cuba. Uh, again, I would point you back to the Secretary's comments and our very clear uh, readouts of this trip where uh, we discussed how the U.S. repeatedly raised these issues uh, with uh, the Secretary's PRC counterparts. The facts are this. The Secretary raised the serious concerns the U.S. would have about any intelligence or military facility in Cuba, saying that we will continue to defend uh, our interests here. The Secretary also raised that the safety and security of American citizens who are wrongfully detained uh, continue to be a top priority, and he directly raised those cases, those subject to wrongful detentions and exit bans. Uh, this is also true as it relates to the fentanyl crisis. This is one of the chief concerns that we raised in our engagements with the PRC, and we secured an agreement with the PRC to work on addressing the illegal flow of fentanyl into our country. Again, this is something that was publicly remarked by the Secretary and reported on by many of you uh, and your colleagues that were on travels with the Secretary. And as it relates to Taiwan, the Chairman again put forward inaccurate information, saying we failed to address this issue. This is uniformly inaccurate. The fact is that the Secretary directly raised China's actions towards Taiwan in his meetings and pointed out that it is the PRC who has sought to upend the status quo. We have been very clear-eyed from here and in our engagements that cross-strait peace uh, continues to be a top priority for us. Uh, but I want to address a broader point, and then I will we'll move on from this, is that um, the broader point that the chairman made is that uh, somehow dialogue with China isn't productive. Uh, and, and we take strong disagreement with that. The facts are is that it is irresponsible not to engage, and it is counterproductive to our interests to not engage. An open dialogue is the best way of maintaining communication is the best way of avoiding misunderstandings that could lead to conflict. Dialogue is also the best way to avoid, uh, to stand up for human rights. Dialogue is the only way we will get detained Americans home. It's the way we will secure cooperation on fentanyl and to defend the economic interests of U.S. workers and companies. So again, it's our views that uh, the chairman's comments were not only inaccurate, uh, but unfortunate, uh, but we'll continue to act in good faith and engage with Congress. And I know that uh, members of our team uh, would be available to discuss the secretary's travels uh, with the chairman and the committee um, should they want it. Up on that a little sure. more specifically yeah. regarding uh, Mark Spinan, Kylie, and, and David Lynn. Did he specifically call for their immediate release? Um, you know, what was his message in his meetings in China regarding the wrongfully detained Americans? Specifically, Mark Spinan is obviously facing the death penalty. There. So uh, I'm certainly not, I'm not going to get into the specifics of, of the diplomatic engagements, but as you uh, know, in uh, in situations where we have uh, wrongful uh, detained American citizens, not just in the PRC but elsewhere, uh, we have called uh, for uh, their release, and the secretary raised these cases directly uh, in his engagements. We have no greater priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas. Uh, we discussed those uh, at great length, and um, I just don't have any other uh, details to offer on that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Nick. Yeah, sure. 
they had said the primary purpose of the Secretary's trip to Beijing was to stabilize the relationship. And the PRC is calling the President's comments on Xi absurd, irresponsible, and a political provocation, as Jenny mentioned. So how does that stabilize the relationship? Nick, the important thing to remember is that it also should come as no surprise that uh, we have differences and disagreements. Uh, the President, uh, the Secretary, they believe in diplomacy. They think that this trip that was recently undertaken, uh, it was a responsible way to manage tensions, to clear up misconceptions, to avoid miscalculations, all of which could uh, uh, lead to uh, further risk. Uh, but as I said in answering Jenny's question um, and Jenny's, is that we won't hesitate to uh, call out areas where we disagree or to be blunt uh, and forthright about some of these differences. And of course, of course, uh, one of those areas uh, that the President and the Secretary have been clear about is uh, the differences between uh, democracies and autocracies and what they have. Um, so again, I, I don't uh, think that the uh, President's comments need to be uh, clarified uh, any further or to be interpreted any, uh, any further, but we've been uh, quite clear about this and is, is consistent with our um, approach as it relates to the PRC. Does this do, do the president's comments? Have they done anything to derail what we expected was future travel by senior U.S. officials to China? Are there, is planning for those travel that travel still in the works? And do you still expect senior? Chinese officials to be visiting the U.S. and is planning for this. Right, right. so you saw the Secretary speak about this in, in his press conference, and we continue to fully expect that future engagements uh, in due course, uh, when the time is appropriate, will continue uh, to plan forward uh, accordingly. Is there a timeline for when one of those senior level visits might occur? Uh, the, obviously, the, the, there's been a lot reported about uh, others in the administration, and I will let um, uh, their spokespeople in those offices speak to that. Uh, let me, uh, I'll come back to you, Jenny. Let me call in a couple more people. Um, go ahead. Yeah. We had the meeting with the Philippines and talk with uh, the U.S. to temporarily host uh, Afghan refugees, especially those who work for the youth uh, in Afghanistan. Can you elaborate on this? And also, this is almost uh, two years that Afghan uh, girls above sixth grade and also women are banded from uh, going to university. We were a witness of pressure and uh, domination, but we haven't seen any changes. Is there any new policy and new strategy for this to pressure the Taliban? So first, on your first question, the United States greatly values our alliance with the Philippines, and we are aware of a draft resolution in the Philippine Senate to conduct an inquiry into the proposed temporary housing in the Philippines of SIV applicants for it. Afghanistan. Uh, we regularly talk to our partners on a number of issues of local, regional, and global importance, and we were made committed to the thousands of brave Afghans who stood side by side with the United States over the course of the past two decades, but uh, I'm not going to uh, get into an active process. Uh, on your second question, uh, we continue to have a number of tools at our disposal to hold the Taliban accountable. We've, you've heard, us, heard me say this before, as it relates to uh, the Taliban's treatment of women and girls, it is a uh, a, 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 a key piece uh, uh, as it relates to their stated desire of international acceptance and legitimacy. And I, until uh, they allow uh, half of their population the same rights, benefits, uh, and access uh, as the other half, uh, it, 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 not only are they holding um, uh, Afghanistan's future back, but uh, they also continue to uh, stand in their way of their own desired um, uh, desire for uh, international acceptance and legitimacy. You've had your hand up patiently. Go ahead. Uh, last week, we saw a team of African nations trying to persuade Vladimir Putin to end the war in Ukraine. What is the view of the U.S. government on those efforts? So you've seen uh, us speak to this uh, broadly, not just as it relates to this group of African leaders, but various peace proposals broadly. Uh, and, and I will say the same thing here, is that we welcome any effort to help end Russia's war against Ukraine. We want this war to end. Uh, Ukraine wants this war to end. Uh, but any outcome must respect President Zelensky's call for a just and lasting peace, uh, one that respects the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And any decision about negotiations must be up to President Zelensky and our Ukrainian partners. 
Uh, that is why uh, we're glad the leaders uh, from Africa visited Kyiv ahead of their meetings in Russia. I will also note is that we talk a lot about peace plans and peace proposals uh, coming from some subset of leaders or coming from one specific country. But the important thing that we uh, need to continue addressing is that Russia continues to uh, uh, show no meaningful interest in ending this war, which is made clear by the fact that African leaders spent hours in bomb shelters while Russia continued to bombard Ukraine uh, during their visit. So we'll continue to help Ukraine defend its democracy and protect its people. So one more. Uh, the U.S. have said many times, and you even repeat it again, that Vladimir Putin have never showed interest in negotiate, negotiate the ending of the war. But we saw President Vladimir Putin saying during the meeting with African leaders that Russia has never refused talks with Ukraine. What, are your, what is your comment on that? I think actions speak louder than words here. And I will just note again is that these very same African leaders uh, spent time in a bomb shelter during their visit when they were in town to uh, push forward and discuss a peace proposal. So. Um, President Putin says a lot of things. Uh, I will leave it up to you all to, differ, uh, to interpret how many of them are true or not. Uh, but again, uh, it, is, it is quite clear in the action, uh, actions of Russia, bombarding Kyiv, targeting civilian infrastructure, targeting energy infrastructure, targeting apartment buildings, targeting hospitals, uh, that they uh, show no meaningful interest in uh, determining peace and ending this war. Uh, understand because he even showed it's hard proposal. to understand uh, hospitals and apartments buildings being bombarded because there's only one country doing that no, but he mentioned that he wants to talk he never refused to talk and he even showed proposal that he has prepared then, to then end why the war. are why are Russian troops still in Ukrainian territory because we don't know actually who is not uh, who don't want to talk if it's Ukraine or if he's because he said Vladimir Putin was very clear that he never refused to talk. I, I we think were trying we know, to understand who don't want to talk. I think we know and we're quite confident who wants to talk and who doesn't want to talk. Throughout the entirety of this conflict, Russia has not shown any meaningful interest in wanting to engage in legitimate conversations around a durable uh, and just and lasting peace. I'm going to work the room. I'm going to work the room a little bit. I, 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 yeah, sure. The reason that I'm asking is because this war is really affecting African nations and everybody wants the, the war to end. If he wants to talk and Vladimir Putin himself even show a proposal, is Ukraine also open to talk? You have to remember here that this is, that the genesis of this is one country, Russia, trying to erase the borders of its neighbor, Ukraine. And they're doing so violently, they're doing so in an unjust way, they're doing so illegally, and they're doing so at the expense of uh, civilians uh, who have been forced to flee their homes, flee uh, where they live. Uh, our partners in Ukraine have been subject to uh, countless attacks and bombardments uh, going back to February of 2022. Uh, and so there's a lot of conversations and calls about peace, but it's important to remember that we are not talking about two aggressors here. We're talking about one country that is infringing on the territorial integrity of another. Uh, and we continue to be very clear that Russia through its actions, not its words, because actions speak louder than words here, uh, has not shown any meaningful interest uh, in uh, engaging in peace. If the Russian Federation was interested, they could start by having its troops leave Ukraine, or they could start by uh, stopping its continued bombardment of uh, civilian and energy infrastructure. I'm gonna work the room. Uh, go ahead. A brief follow-up so I can get to your colleagues. Do you have a comment on whether the, the peace proposal that she's referencing, whether that's a legitimate document? That is for President Zelensky and our Ukrainian partners to determine. That's not for us or for any country to, uh, 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 to, to, to give, uh, uh, editorialize uh, on, a, on a peace process well, or not. Who's claiming that the document was what she's referring to? It's a 2022 document, he claims, that was a peace proposal 
a, a couple countries were a party to it. Do, do you know whether that... Since 2022, you have seen clear action from the Russian Federation uh, that they are not interested in peace. Uh, so I will just leave it at that. And any uh, path forward and any negotiation uh, and any discussion about peace uh, is up to President Zelensky and our Ukrainian partners. Until then, we're going to continue to take steps to help Ukraine defend its democracy uh, and defend its people. Uh, I think you just get one more on Ukraine. Um, there were reports last week, as well as statements by a Ukrainian ambassador, that Australia, the U.S., and Ukraine are, are considering providing F-18 fighter jets, U.S. made, Australian owned. Um, so you don't have to confirm or comment on that, but I'm bringing it up because I think it illustrates kind of this continued, you know, as each week goes by in this war, there's sort of a push of the Overton window on what we, the U.S., are willing to provide. So often weapons that were previously deemed, even by this administration, to be too escalatory. Um, last year, Joe Biden was asked whether the U.S. would provide F-16s to Ukraine, and he said no because, quote, that's called World War III, and now, of course, we are providing F-16s and maybe even F-18s, which are the more powerful model. Um, this Monday, Biden reportedly told donors that the risk of Putin using a tactical nuke is a real possibility. So my question is, why do we casually continue down this path of you know, providing stronger and stronger weapons when even the president himself is acknowledging the risk of nuclear war? Well, that was like five questions when I said a, a brief follow-up. So uh, uh, let me let me try to uh, unpack that. Uh, I, I don't have any uh, news to share or specific updates as it uh, relates to any uh, security assistance. Uh, broadly, though, throughout the uh, course of this conflict, we have uh, in close coordination with the Department of Defense, of course, and Secretary Austin uh, has done immense, important work and shown great leadership through the Ramstein process. Uh, we have uh, made a assessments by uh, in close coordination with our allies and partners about uh, the types of uh, 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 technologies and systems uh, that uh, we feel uh, uh, our Ukrainian partners need. Um, and so I will let uh, the, that process play out. I don't have anything uh, to speak to on that. Um, and that has been our, um, our strategy as it relates to uh, security assistance for our Ukrainian partners. The risk of nuclear war. So, uh, again, uh, you saw the secretary speak about this in his uh, press conference with his Singaporean counterpart. We've seen those reports of the Russia-Belarus agreement, and we'll continue to actively monitor uh, the situation and how it unfolds uh, and its implications. Uh, we've not seen any reason to adjust our own nuclear posture. Uh, but again, and this is something that the president has spoken about also, um, this kind of rhetoric about nuclear weapons is reckless and irresponsible from President Putin. It also underscores President Putin's uh, hypocrisy on this. All right, Goyle, you've patiently had your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is on uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India, who just arrived in Washington after uh, addressing the 180 nations, marking the ninth anniversary of uh, International Day of Yoga in New York at the United Nations. Here at the Freedom Plaza, he was greeted by hundreds of Indian American community members. My question is here that what are we expecting one because there is so much expectations going on because he is going to address, of course, the uh, uh, joint session of uh, U.S. Congress. And uh, also at the same time, when the secretary was in uh, Beijing, China, was there any discussion about ne Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Washington at all? Uh, and second, uh, what are we expecting triangle uh, U.S., India, and China when Prime Minister Modi meets with the high-level officials at the White House, including, of course, President Biden. Thanks, Boyle. Uh, let me try to unpack that first. Happy International Day of Yoga to um, any and all who, who celebrate. Um, I, I certainly don't have any other specifics about the Secretary's meetings in, in Beijing to share beyond uh, what we read out, but uh, if you'll allow me, uh, also as it relates to Prime Minister Modi's state visit, um, I'm going to let the scheduling of the state visit uh, play out and certainly don't want to uh, get uh, ahead of that, but I know that uh, the Secretary is looking forward to uh, taking part in, uh, in, in these high-level engagements tomorrow and Friday, uh, both at the White House and uh, here uh, at the State Department as well. Uh, but this visit, it celebrates the U.S.-India partnership as one of the most important bilateral relationships that uh, we have uh, in the 21st century. And this is about uh, 
our partnership and deepening our relationship uh, with India. Uh, and after years of strengthening ties, the U.S.-India partnership is deeper and more expansive than it's ever been. We now work cooperatively to uphold a free and open Indo-Pacific. We drive innovation and jointly tackle global challenges. Uh, together, we're working with other like-minded partners. Uh, our countries will shape the future, uh, working towards a world that is open, prosperous, secure, stable, and resilient. And I know the Secretary, the President, um, are very much looking forward to engaging with Prime Minister Modi, his team, uh, and other members of the Indian delegation on this visit. Just quickly, quickly follow, sir. Please, thank you. Um, how this visit will be different than in the past, Prime Minister Modi was also at the White House, and he met with the Secretary and also the President on several occasions, including uh, di in different countries, Quad and all that. So how this visit will be different? So the, first of all, this is uh, a state visit, and so those, of course, are, are, um, are a, a little different than previous bilateral visits. But really, this isn't about comparing this visit with any other. What this is about is deepening uh, and broadening and strengthening our relationship with our Indian partners. Uh, and that's why very much we're uh, looking forward to uh, welcoming them today, starting today. Um, Jenny, you've had your hand up. Go ahead. Hearing tomorrow. Do you have any comment on expectations from the U.S. on that hearing? Will Ambassador Tracy be in attendance? And has there been any additional consular access to Evan or any requests that have been denied? Well, we, we continue to feel that the, this whole uh, legal process as it relates to Evan uh, is a sham. Uh, we've been very clear that Evan is wrongfully detained, uh, being uh, wrongfully detained and targeted uh, for simply doing his job uh, at a journalist as a journalist. Um, I don't have specifics. Uh, about uh, what to expect uh, at this at this next hearing, uh, as is, has previously been the case, I am sure that we will have uh, representation from uh, the embassy, uh, and I don't have any specific updates on on consular access. But I'm I'm happy to check that and get back to you. Uh, I go ahead. Yes. I'll come back to you, Alex. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is in uh, Washington D.C. already. Prior to this visit. Uh, Jack Sullivan, National Security Advisor, met with uh, Odit Doval, the Security Advisor of India. And at that meeting, uh, um, Odit Doval uh, stated, it is important for India to all countries to refrain from taking any initiative in neighboring countries that may have negative impact on their national interest. Leading Indian Daily quoted him as saying, U.S. should not do anything that disturbs the balance and stability in the region of uh, Southeast Asia. For example, in the time of Khaledesia's regime in Bangladesh, there was 10 truck uh, military grade arms was about to smuggle to Ulfa, the terrorist organization in Assam, and it was uh, uh, the main issue about the security. So yeah, you will comment on that, please. Thank you. Uh, a comment on, on uh, what, what's your question that specifically? The U.S. should not do anything that disturbs the balance uh, and stability in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, Southeast Asia. Well, uh, I, I will say two things. First, uh, broadly, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, will uh, not hesitate to act and engage on issues um, and, and areas that are in its interest. Uh, but what I will also say is that as it relates to the region, uh, India is an important partner uh, on a lot of these pursuits. As I said, we work cooperatively with our Indian partners to uphold a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, we jointly tackle global challenges, uh, and we look forward to deepening our relationship with our Indian partners to continue to work towards a world and an Indo-Pacific region, including Southeast Asia, that is open, prosperous, secure, uh, stable, and uh, resilient. Alex, you've had your hand up. Go ahead. Uh -huh. The European you. Parliament last week um, rec recognized the bombing uh, of the Kharkov State Dam as a war crime committed by Russia. Just after your song, uh, where are you at uh, in terms of your investigation? Uh, I don't have uh, any updates for you, Alex. We uh, can't conclusively uh, say what happened. Uh, one thing is, it continues to be clear, which is that uh, Russia uh, started this war, uh, and it was Russia that occupied this area of Ukraine, and it was Russia's 
uh, forces that illegally seized the dam last year. Uh, we continue to remain in close touch with Ukrainian authorities on aiding the many civilians displaced and forced to flee their homes out of safety. Uh, we've uh, swung into action uh, to help and will continue to uh, work with humanitarian partners on the ground, both through uh, the State Department and USAID as well. And a separate topic on uh, Azerbaijan and Yeritz, mm -hmm. Mokhtar yeah. focuses. We have seen uh, multiple reports about uh, shelling in the border area uh, during the past couple of days, just when the foreign minister was supposed to be in this town negotiating about peace. Um, firstly, your reaction about that, and also where are we at in terms of uh, you know, putting together another meeting? So uh, we look forward to uh, hosting another round of talks in Washington uh, soon as the parties continue to pursue a peaceful future uh, in the South Caucasus region. We continue to believe uh, direct dialogue is key to resolving issues and reaching a durable and dignified peace. And that also, uh, Alex, I think answers uh, your uh, first question on this is that we continue to believe that steps that uh, are going to incite tensions and uh, uh, elevate tensions uh, are certainly uh, unproductive right now as the talks between Armenia and Azerbaijan are proceeding in different venues. Uh, and so uh, we'll continue to engage on this and look forward to hosting another round of talks very soon. Go. I'm going to work the room, Alex. Okay, go ahead. Lavrov yesterday appeared to have downplayed your mediating efforts by saying that it's all about you know, squeezing Russia out of the region. Is that what you guys are doing? If so, thank you, but I just wanted to clarify. If, 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 if Russia thinks that they can play a constructive role uh, in this, uh, certainly they are, are, are welcome to, but uh, we continue to feel that uh, these talks are uh, progressing, they're proceeding. Uh, the United States uh, has uh, been an important partner in this. The Secretary personally has uh, been engaged on this. I know, Alex, you've uh, worked on this issue and followed it very closely and are aware of the, the, the number of uh, engagements that have happened both at the secretary's level and at the working level. Uh, and this is all reflected of the fact that we think direct dialogue is key to resolving this issue and reaching a durable and dignified peace. And we also um, continue to think that uh, uh, that dialogue can't be re replaced in this process. All right, Joel, go ahead. My first question is about uh, uh, 57 congressmen and 18 senators have written a letter to President Biden about the human rights violation by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I know the relationship with India are very consequential and important and broadening and stuff, but just particularly Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and, and they have written that about the human rights violations, about the way he treats Muslims, especially journalists, and I have never heard you, State Department, condemn it. That's, uh, we have talked about human rights uh, at the nexus of a number of countries uh, around the world. We've done so uh, clearly, uh, the Secretary's done so, I've done so, others have done so from behind this podium. Uh, and as we do with other nations around the world, we regularly engage uh, at the senior levels uh, on our human rights concerns, including freedom of religion and freedom of belief. Our view is that a secure, prosperous, and democratic um, uh, and pluralistic India is a natural partner for the United States, and that I'm sure is something our Indian partners uh, view as well. Uh, we also regularly meet with civil society representatives, both in the United States and in India, and in other parts of the world where we uh, raise uh, these issues as well. Uh, we value their perspective, and uh, we think that it's critical to help them to inform our work as well. Sure. Uh, today, the ambassador of the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, David Bloom, had a meeting with finance minister. Do you have any insight as to what was that meeting regarding? The, the Pakistani finance minister? Yes. Uh, I don't have any specifics uh, as it relates to that meeting. I'm happy to check. Um, but uh, of course, we engage regularly with uh, Pakistani officials. Uh, and you've heard me say this before. Our engagement is critical to our ultimate goal, which is a um, stable, secure, and, and, and pr prosperous Pakistan. But I'm happy to check okay. for details. One small thing. Uh -huh. uh, when ambassador level uh, meet the other finance ministers and stuff. I'm sure that it's probably because of the financial situation Pakistan is in. And the ambassador gets a little profile of the finance minister and the head of the meeting. So does the, will the ambassador sort of ask the finance minister that in the last 20 years, the economic situation of the country has de deteriorated, but his own personal accounts 
have multiplied like I, I, I'm times. not gonna speculate on the the, the comments and, and what was discussed in the meeting um, I'm happy to, to look into it but again our view is that our engagement with uh, Pakistani officials is important because it is in line with our broader goal which is a stable secure and prosperous Pakistan which is not just uh, in the interest of the region but it is also in the interest of the United States as well uh, Said go ahead I don't know if you addressed the South Sudan issue uh, the uh, UN envoy, Nicholas Haysen, uh, spoke to the, the Security Council and he warned of an impending uh, catastrophe in South Sudan as a result of 115,000 uh, men, women, and children uh, going into South Sudan, uh, compounded, of course, by the chaotic and the lack of the sharing of power. I wonder if you have any comment on what is going on in South Sudan as it relates to the Sudan crisis. Uh, I've not seen those comments, Said, so I, I, I'd have to check in on that for you. All right, go ahead, and then we'll wrap so, up on that. Yes, so um, the U.S. officials reportedly have gathered information, intelligence information about um, Bali and CP uh, staff members going in and out of the Cuban, the Chinese uh, intelligence facility in Cuba. Um, so I'm wondering if you can confirm that information, if you're aware um, that the Chinese telecom companies are involved in um, the surveillance work for China in Cuba. And secondly, um, there are reports saying that China and Cuba, Cuba are actively um, working on another um, joint military training facility in Cuba. So can you confirm that information? How do you respond? So I, I'm not going to uh, speak to any uh, potential intelligence uh, from up here uh, certainly would be inappropriate to do that. Uh, but broadly, uh, we are monitoring and uh, responding to any PRC uh, attempts to expand its military or security presence around the world. And we watch how uh, potential PRC actions uh, may impact the United States. Uh, our experts assess that our diplomatic efforts have slowed uh, the PRC down, and uh, there, of course, continue to still be challenges, uh, but we continue to be concerned about the PRC's longstanding activities uh, with Cuba. And the PRC will keep trying to enhance its presence in Cuba, and we will keep uh, working uh, to disrupt it. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to get into more from here. All right, thanks, everyone.